What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the HQ. Welcome, bike to the channel. I am Nicholas. This is BDG, Big Dogs Got Eat Fantasy Football. We're doing a refresher today of my top 10 overall fantasy football rankings. I know we don't usually put out videos on Saturday, but guess what? For the next couple of weeks, we will be doing it. So, Monday to Friday, now Monday to Saturday, six days a week, baby. We're going hard for the remainder of the summer to help you prep for your 2019 fantasy football drafts. Today, top 10 overall rankings for 2019 fantasy football. This is going to be angled from a half PPR standpoint, but you're going to be able to take away a lot of actionable information for whatever league you're in PPR standard. And I will be making my top 50 overall rankings available to y'all. That will be the first link down below in the description. I'll probably pin it in the comments as well. So if you just go over to that link, you'll be able to access my top 50 overall rankings for half PPR standard PPR. So go check those out if you're interested in more overall rankings. As always, we're going to be giving away a draft guide for this episode. The draft guide giveaway question will be, who do you think will have the worst record in the NFL this year? Who is going to be the NFL's worst team in 2019 and why? Comment that down below and you will automatically be entered into the draft guide giveaway, which I will decide in next Saturday's video. Comment that. Tell me why. Drop some big facts along with it and you will automatically be entered down below. Hit that thumbs up button while you're down there. Let's get into the overall rankings. Boom. So we are at the 101 and I've had a change this week in who my 101 is. If you have the draft guide on bigdogdraftguide.com, you will already have seen the change in my rankings. At the 101, the new crown king, Alvin Kamara of the New Orleans Saints. And I understand he might not get the workhorse touches that a Saquon Barkley gets or a Zeke or whatever. But man, you cannot find a better situation than what Alvin Kamara finds himself in in this New Orleans offense. Maybe you look at him as like a low touch guy. You're like, oh, he's not great for standard. He's so involved in the passing game. But he's had 1,550 yards from scrimmage in back-to-back seasons, a rookie season in which he was not really utilized over the first three, four weeks of the season. Last year, he missed a game. No matter how you're getting those yards, receptions or rushing, that's fine for standard. So we're talking about 31 touchdowns over the last two years, 80 receptions, bike to bike. Jesus Christ! Amine voice. Jesus Christ! I buy that shit before I even know the price. Last year, he was nine yards away from hitting 1,600 yards from scrimmage. He only played in 15 games. He scored 18 touchdowns. The touchdowns and the efficiency are not fluky whatsoever. There is no one in the NFL who is used better than Alvin Kamara. The way the Saints use him is to absolute perfection. And the reason that this efficiency, that these receptions are not fluky is because the way they use him is he's like a hybrid player, basically. He had about 750 snaps on offense last year, 200 of them. So over 25% came from either in the slot or out wide. That is why he catches so many balls. He is such a versatile player and so good in the receiving game that he plays a large majority of his snaps outside of the backfield. He's not that workhorse guy, but you don't want him to be the workhorse guy. And as for touchdowns, they're not fluky either when you look at how they use him. Last year, right, he was splitting time with Ingram and he only played 15 games. Despite missing a game, his ranks among NFL running backs last year, second in red zone carries with 51, second in 10 zone carries, Fourth in goal line carries, 34 and 13, only behind Todd Gurley in all of those categories. First in red zone targets. He was sixth overall, wide receiver, tight end running backs with 26 red zone targets. Second among running backs in 10 zone targets, only behind James White. The guy is not lucky or hyper efficient. The Saints just use him to perfection and they use him very heavily down by the end zone, which is going to continue to happen. We already know how they're going to use him. So his floor is probably double digit, probably closer to 12 touchdowns. And again, 1600 yards from scrimmage. This is going to be a very good offense. Again, led by Drew Brees. They should be Super Bowl contenders. There's no reason to skip on Alvin Kamara at the top of your drafts. Let's move over to the 102. Christian McCaffrey. Now he was my 101 for a while leading up until earlier on this week when I just came to my senses and said, fuck it, Kamara's probably the safest guy up top. Let's roll with him. Guy's obviously a stud, and I'm going to have to argue against why he shouldn't be the 101. He's going to be very heavily involved, of course, in this offense, who should be a pretty good offense. I just don't think he has the ceiling. Like, if you're drafting him at 101, you want him for the ceiling that he provided to you last year. I don't think he has that same ceiling this year. I think he's still going to be very good, but I don't think he has that same ceiling, and I'll explain exactly why, right? I've heard a ton of reports dating back to the beginning of the offseason, pretty much, and they're resurfacing again as early as this week. The Panthers are trying to find a backup who can ideally take a lot of Christian McCaffrey's short yardage and goal line work. The team plans to limit 
McCaffrey's plays. Panthers OC Norv Turner wants to be smarter about his usage. They were concerned about the number of times McCaffrey handled the ball last season. You know, after like 78 reports, you eventually have to be like, okay, maybe there is something to this. And I think there is because they have credibility dating back to last season. Last offseason, all they said was, we want to use Christian McCaffrey like a workhorse. We want him to be the three down guy. We want him to touch the ball at a crazy level. And that's exactly what happened. So now when they're switching gears and say, hey, we want to limit him in short yard situations and goal line situations, and they probably want to do that given that they did exactly what they wanted to do last year. And it makes sense just given the sheer volume workload that McCaffrey had last year relative to his teammates. If you look at the bottom of this tweet, make sure you're following me on Twitter, Nick underscore BDGE. In 2017, McCaffrey's rookie year, he had a 70% snap share, which is nice, but he only took 45% of the running back touches in Carolina. Red zone, goal line, 10 zone, sub 20 percent in all those categories jump up to last year his snaps go up to 91 percent 95 percent of the Carolina running back touches despite him barely playing in 2017 went to McCaffrey a huge percentage of that work down by the red zone 10 zone goal line maybe there is a lot of truth to these reports because his his workload was massive and I know he's showing absolutely zero concerns from the durability standpoint but if they keep saying it there is probably some truth to it Now, he scored six of his seven rushing touchdowns last year from inside the four-yard line. So six of the seven came on goal line carries. This could be a big hit to his value if they do use someone else down there, who I think realistically is probably the best bet to be that guy is actually Cam Newton. Last year, Cam Newton had three goal line carries. That is it, three. 14.3% of the Panthers' overall goal line carries. In the seven years prior, from 2011 as rookie season up to 2017, Cam had averaged 7.3 goal line carries and 32% of the team's overall goal line carries per season. That's on average. So last year, he only had three goal line carries. He normally averages over seven. So if we see that come back to the norm, that's going to take away a lot of Christian McCaffrey's usage, of course. Despite all these reports about them wanting to use him less, it's hard to take them seriously when they didn't. I mean, they could have easily just gone out and signed, you know, LeGarrette Blunt to play that short yardage goal line work, despite how bad he looked last year. They drafted Jordan Scarlett in the fifth round, but Jordan Scarlett is basically the same size as Christian McCaffrey, if not smaller. It's hard to really imagine who is going to be the running back to take those carries away. And I don't care if someone takes like the first and 10 carries from Christian McCaffrey that go, you know, for two yards and he just bangs into the offensive lineman. That's not really a value concern from Christian McCaffrey. But if they take the goal line carries away, it's going to be something that really limits Christian McCaffrey ceiling because he doesn't really have that big of a rushing touchdown ceiling to begin with. Six of those seven rushing touchdowns that he had last year, I'm not saying they're going to take away all of it, but those are where the majority of his touchdowns come from. The other thing I want I want to really dive into is those 104 receptions that he had last year were a record, right? No other running back had caught that many passes in a single season. He set the record. I don't think he's going to be touching that, right? I still think he's going to be around the 80 mark. But when we look back last year, Cam was throwing the ball short and dinking and dumping the entire season. And it was because his shoulder wasn't close to 100%. Cam Newton's adjusted completion percentage last year was 78% by far the highest of his career. So he was completing passes at a, at an abnormal rate for him. He's never had an adjusting completion percentage over 72.5% in the season. However, his average depth of throw was 7.6 yards down the field, by far the lowest of his career. He's never had an A dot lower than 8.9 yards. Again, the dump offs were crazy. DJ Moore, we're looking at Curtis Samuel, two guys who are developing into nice outside wide receivers. There are going to be a lot more downfield shots. There are going to be a lot more dink and dump offs to those guys. I just don't think Christian McCaffrey has the 100 reception upside. He's still going to catch 80 balls, but Cam is going to be throwing the ball more downfield now that his shoulder is completely healed. We're seeing all these reports out of camp that his deep passes are the surprise of the camp and he's connecting at a very high rate. That is very good news for Cam. Probably not that good of news for C-Mac. Again, like I'm obviously making the case for him at 102 over 101. The Panthers should have low-key a very good offensive line, which is always good for fantasy. I still think, again, that he's going to catch about 80 passes, but if you take a little bit of the goal line work away, you take away, you know, 20 receptions, that limits the ceiling. And I don't think he has anywhere near the floor or the upside that Kamara offers in the touchdown department. So they'll have probably a similar workload as they did last year. And uh, I'll take the guy in probably the better offense and has more scoring opportunity. So here's my 102. 103, Saquon Barkley, New York Giants. I might regret this simply because he's just so damn good. You just look at the Giants offense overall. The sting of owning David Johnson last year, 
makes this pick just too real. Got to be the 103 for me. I mean, there's a great chance, again, that I look dumb coming back and looking at this last year because Barkley's just the most ridiculously talented running back that we've seen in a long, 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 long time, and that he just makes it happen because he's so damn good. But I'm just going to skip on the headache of owning any New York Giant this year, maybe outside of Evan Ingram or Sterling Shepard in like the 12th round. And sure, their O-line should be better with, you know, adding Kevin Zeitler to it, but I still don't think it's going to be like top 12 and up to the point where that's going to outweigh the ebbs and flows of this overall offense, man. As long as Eli is under center, this offense is not going to run smoothly. I mean, the upside, of course, is very real with just the sheer volume, uh, the sheer talent that Barkley brings to the table, but the red flags are there and smacking you in the face. At 104, Devontae Adams, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers. Y'all know my thoughts on Devontae Adams this year. If you have the draft guide, you know I am absolutely in love with this guy. I will link a video up there wherever it goes up, as well as in the description of me going very in-depth on Devontae Adams this year. I think he is going to break records. This is the official year. 2019 is the official Devastation Adams season. Go watch that video if you want to further break down. But Devontae Adams by 104. Another wide receiver at the 105 is DeAndre Hopkins of the Houston Texans. Not too difficult to understand here. And I typically don't love using my first round pick, especially this early on a wide receiver, whether it's Adams or Hopkins. But it's the Hopkins show in Houston again. Kiki QT is banged up already. I don't know if he's going to miss regular season time, but he's probably going to get off to a slow start. Will Fuller is still only eight months removed from his AC ACL tear, his ACL surgery. Uh, so he's going to need more time before he's 100%. Hopkins is going to get a 30% plus target share again with one of the brightest up and coming quarterbacks in the NFL. You don't have to think too hard about this one. With Deshaun Watson under center, Hopkins is 16 game pace. He's had 23 games with Watson under center. If you ratio it out to 16 games, 111 receptions, 1,515 receiving yards, and 12 and a half touchdowns. Sounds about right. You can go with a high upside running back if you want, but if I know I'm getting 111 receptions, 1,500 receiving yards, and 12 to 13 touchdowns, that's that's a no-brainer. The floor is so high. Draft him with confidence. Move along. For a guy who you project for those numbers, there's no reason to get risky and take a running back and jump up for a running back that has a ton of red flags at the running back position. Those are the top five so far. Again, all I ask is that you guys hit that thumbs up button if you are finding this informational, if you're finding it valuable. I very, very, very much appreciate that. If you want my top 50 overall rankings, all you got to do is click that link down below in the description or at the top of the comment section. Let's move over to David Johnson. I'm going to need to take a breath for this one because we got a lot to talk about when it comes to David Johnson. He is at my 106. Now we've had two games already. I'm filming this on Friday. You're watching it on Saturday, most likely. This is right after the first two preseason games. I did not love what I saw in the first preseason game out of Arizona. DJ had two runs directly up the middle, wasn't using the slot at all. We got to see him out there again last night in their week two game. And again, I did not like what I saw from DJ. I did not like what I saw overall from this offense. And I know what everyone is going to say. We haven't really seen their offense in preseason. They are hiding everything. They're not showing us any anything. If that's the case, they are doing a fucking phenomenal job of hiding it because we haven't seen shit from this offense. And listen, I get it. They don't want to show the teams the real air raid, the hurry up, whatever it is. But it's, what do you, do you think they're wasting their time in practice literally making sure that they have a whole separate offense from what they're going to run? A lot of the plays are definitely the same plays. Maybe the pace is not there yet in these preseason games, but these are the same plays that they're going to be running in the offs in the regular season. They're going a high percentage from the shotgun, which is exactly what they do in the air raid offense. A lot of dink and dump passes, which Kyler Murray has been doing. A lot of runs from the shotgun for David Johnson. It's the same plays. They're not developing and wasting practice time just to create a fake offense. The pace is going to be more up-tempo, but from what we've seen, it, it does not look good, guys. The five series is that we've seen with Kyler under center so far. Punt, 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 safety. Despite all this hype about David Johnson being used more in the passing game and him lining up from the slot more, he has not lined up. I, someone might be able to correct me on this, but I've watched both games and I do not think I've seen DJ line up in the slot in a single snap so far. They set up a few screen plays for him, but nothing much came from it. And I mean, he was used in the screen game last year too, and nothing much really came from it. The, the far majority of his runs have come from the shotgun in the preseason. And that's probably what we'll see a lot. Again, that's how the air raid offense works. But we've seen very, very, very little success from the carries that he's had so far. 10 rushing yards on six carries. He has 11 receiving yards on two screen plays so far. And I don't, I, I could care less about preseason stats. I want to know more about the usage, but it's scary just how bad this offensive line has looked. Despite all the fake news narratives about their offensive line, upgrades. It's been completely negligible. They haven't really added any studs to the offensive line. So this is definitely still a monster cause for concern. And you know, him running from the shotgun might sound exciting, but realistically, when you look at his career stats from the shotgun, 4.1 yards per carry under center 4.0, there is no 
difference in uh, his efficiency when running under. And I know I have DJ ranked as sixth, and that's pretty damn high. So it's hard for me to completely bash him. But what I will say is the reason he's up here is because we have guys like Ezekiel Elliott, Melvin Gordon, holdout contract situation. So I will tell you, they will not be on this top 10 list already. I will not be drafting either of these guys until they sign. The deeper we get into the off season without a contract for either of them, the farther they're going to fall down my list. So those guys would be ahead of uh, David Johnson for me. If Gurley was healthy, he'd be ahead of David Johnson for me. So there's a good chance DJ might not crack the top 10 had this off season not been so weird for a lot of the top tier players, but he's in here for by default for me. And I'm looking at like just Vegas odds. What does Vegas suspect from David Johnson? These are some guys that have a higher rushing touchdown over under per Vegas for 2019. Chris Carson, Devonta Freeman, Mark Ingram, Damian Williams, Derrick Henry, guys that have higher rushing yardage totals over under per Vegas this year. Aaron Jones, Chris Carson, Dalvin Cook, Carry On, and Marlon Mack. All of those guys have better rushing touchdown upsides and or better rushing yardage total upsides. And those aren't the studs. These aren't the Ezekiel Elliott's. These aren't Saquon Barkley's, right? These are guys who you're getting in like the mid second, third, even fourth or fifth rounds of your drafts. And Vegas is pegging them to have a, around the same rushing yardage usage as David Johnson. And I'll say this, right? DJ has run almost every single play with Kyler on the first team on the field so far this preseason. So that's good to know that he's going to be the clear cut workhorse. But I don't think there was any concerns about that. That really the key takeaway here is is this that you cannot just assume everything is going to work out in Arizona this is a funny tweet from Steve uh, Steve writes best ball articles on Big Dogs Fantasy Weekly for us so if you want to go check that out on the site bigdogsfantasy.com go to the blog section he says it's going to be hard to run 90 plays when your time of possession is eight minutes a game right and we've had Cliff come out and say he wants to run 90 plays a game that's impossible it's never going to happen but the key point here is just how bad their defense is, how bad their defense is going to be. And in turn, that gives the opposing offense very long drives. They're going to have lots of time of possession, thus limiting the offensive plays Arizona can have. And we know that we want players to run a lot of snaps. You want to give your players opportunity to touch the ball. I don't know if we're going to get that in Arizona. They have Patrick Peterson, one of the league's best cornerbacks, already missing six games to start the year. Last night, Robert Alford, their number two cornerback behind Pat Peterson, who they signed to a $22.5 million contract this offseason, fractured his tibia and is going to miss a significant portion of the regular season. So they were already a horrible defense and now they're missing their top two cornerbacks. This defense is going to struggle and we've already seen it this preseason. The Chargers, the Raiders are eating them up on the defensive side of the ball. This offensive line is going to be bad. The other team is going to possess the ball for a long time. There are a lot of red flags here for DJ. All in all, DJ is going to be the workhorse and there will be big plays to be had. I'm sure he'll have his big week and garbage time will probably be a thing for Arizona. I think they're projected for five and a half wins this year for Vegas. So DJ probably is going to catch like three or four passes a game in the fourth quarter, but I'm not expecting anywhere near a ton of rushing production from DJ and neither is Vegas as I kind of showed you guys before. So before you, the, the whole purpose of this entire breakdown and me hitting you with the big facts is before you move DJ into that top tier of running backs, the Kamaras, the Chris McCaffrey's, the Saquon Barkley's, think twice because the red flags are here. They are very serious and I'm not putting him up there. We already have Devontae Adams. We already have DeAndre Hopkins who will catch 100 plus passes, something DJ is not going to do, who are going to go for 1,400 to 1,600 yards from scrimmage, which DJ might do, but where they really make it up for is in the touchdown department. I do not see DJ scoring, you know, the 13 touchdowns that I think D-Hop and Devontae Adams are going to score. So PPR, these other guys who are going to have the same yardage and touchdown totals, if not higher than DJ, are going to catch a lot more passes than DJ. So it doesn't make sense to go with DJ over those two wide receivers. 107, we have Julio Jones. Much of the same can be said for Julio that I said for DeAndre Hopkins. Over the last five seasons, Julio's 16 game averages 169 targets, 109 receptions, 1,661 yards. Obviously, the reason that we find him down on this list a little further down is he's averaged six and a half touchdowns over his 16 game pace for the last five seasons. Never fewer than 88 receptions or 1,444 receiving yards in those 16 game paces. We have Dirk Cutter coming in who is horrible at producing anything from the running back and the ground game standpoint. They're going to be throwing the ball at a clip of 65%, if not at a higher rate. They don't play outside of a dome until like week 12 or week 13 this year. Julio is Vegas' odds on favorite to lead the NFL in receiving yards, tied per Vegas odds to lead the NFL in receptions. He is fifth in touchdowns. So who knows? Maybe one of these years we get that big touchdown upside. Over the second half of last season, I believe he scored eight touchdowns in the final eight games of their season. And we talked to Dr. Morris. We're not worried about the foot injury. I believe he's very, very, very close to getting back on the field. I don't know if we'll see him at all this preseason. He's balled out on that same foot for the last couple of years, and it's not like a new significant injury or anything. So Julio at the 107, I am fine with. 108, Travis Kelsey, the tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. I will preface this by saying he is the 108 in my rankings. 
However, when you take everything into context, <coughs> woo, excuse me, he will not be, I'm not going to be drafting him in the eighth slot. Why I have him in my rankings here is because he is every bit as much of a, a value pick at the 108 as anyone. He will give you a monster positional advantage at the tight end position, which you will get to experience week over week over week. And I think he is worth the 108. If someone took him at 108, I wouldn't be mad. I'm just not particularly doing it because the running back position is very, very shallow this year in fantasy, right? So I want to use my first three-ish picks on an elite wide receiver and running backs. I don't want to use it on the tight end because I'd be fine having my tight end one in the fifth, sixth, seventh round, whether it's OJ Howard, Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry, one of those guys. The fall off from elite running backs to mid-tier running backs is huge. Having Kelsey is a huge advantage, but getting Hunter Henry or Evan Ingram or whatever in your lineup is going to be like a, a league losing scenario. So Kelsey's coming off a year where he defini- where he finished at the tight end one despite competing with a tight end that set the record for most receptions in a season and a tight end that set the record for most receiving yards in the season. Still finishes the tight end one. Kelsey is a fucking monster and will probably have a bigger year than he did last year. So Kelsey at the 108, I am completely fine with this. I'm not going to yell at you for that. Odell Beckham Jr. comes in at the 109 for the Cleveland Browns. I just think that sometimes fantasy football doesn't have to be that hard. You combine OBJ, one of the, if not the most elite, talented wide receiver that we've seen in the NFL in a long time with a quarterback who is one of the most accurate passers in the NFL and good things are going to happen. He is dealing with some kind of hip pointer injury right now. He didn't play in week two or he's not going to play in week two because of it. Head coach Freddie Kitchens came out and said that if it had been a regular season game, he would have suited up. So this tells me that the three weeks that we have before the NFL season actually kicks off should be enough time to rest him and get him right for the regular season. Unfortunately, we won't see him in the preseason at all, but it's definitely something to monitor. I know it was a big concern for me coming into the season, OBJ's injury history, right? Dr. Morse said, or Dr. Morse's rating in the draft guide, right? In the Big Dogs draft guide, which is on bigdogsdraftguide.com, he has an injury write-up profile for every injury-concerned player so far this offseason. We have a rating, 1 to 10, what their re-injury risk is, and he put Odell at like a 3. So he's not concerned about Odell's injury. I will be talking to Dr. Jesse Morse this weekend at some point, and we're going to bring this injury up and see if he moves OBJ up in the in the rating in terms of re-injury risk rating. But it sounds like it's not too serious. So it's something to monitor, but he should be all systems go. Now, OBJ has obviously been one of the most prolific wide receivers up to this point in his career his early career with Eli as his quarterback. And Eli's deep accuracy has ranked among the bottom quarterbacks so far in, you know, since OBJ has come into the league. Now you swap it over to Baker Mayfield. And I know that moving teams is whatever, but I just think the talent pair is just too high to use that as a negative outlook piece. You know what I mean? Baker last year in his limited sample size was one of the most high volume deep passers and one of the top five most accurate deep passers per PFF. So you combine those two things and it looks like, looks like some very, good matchmaking there. So the injury concerns are there, which is why I don't have them up there with the DeAndre Hopkins and Devontae Adams. If you want to fade him because of the injury concerns, I definitely would not be mad at you. And I won't be taking him in every draft if I have the opportunity to, but I definitely will be targeting him in one or two of my season long drafts. Definitely want some OBJ shares because his outlook, his range of outcomes for 2019 is absolutely the wide receiver one overall for fantasy. And we will move on to our 110. I'm interested in knowing who you guys think the 110 is going to be here. So you heard the 109 and you heard everything prior to that. Drop a comment down below along with who you think is going to be the NFL's worst team and why. You'll be automatically entered into the Big Dog Draft Guide giveaway. Who do you think I have at 110? I'll give you a few seconds to to figure that out or, or guess. While you're down there, hit that thumbs up button. If you're listening via podcast, uh, a quick rating and review would be fantastic. All you got to do is go over to the podcast page and there will be a little empty five stars. If you click the star all the way to the right, the fifth star, that will marinate into a five-star rating and review for you. Boy, it lets me know that you appreciate the work that I've been putting in for all these videos. 110 is Nick Chubb, running back of the Cleveland Browns. So we have two Cleveland Brown running backs rounding out the top 10 overall. I went deep on Nick Chubb in my must-own running backs video last week, which is kind of blown up, which is pretty cool. Um, But Nick Chubb is also ready to blow up and is in a prime position to do so. Last year, he was amazing as an NFL running back. I know it was a somewhat limited sample size, but he was the second highest graded overall runner per PFF last year. He had the single highest elusive grade among any running back with more than 60 carries, the single highest yards after contact rating among all NFL running backs. He had Four runs of 40 plus yards last season, top 10 in breakaway runs. This guy is is big. He's got the workhorse size and he's a big play waiting to happen given his size, speed, score. You're concerned about the pass catching now that we have Duke Johnson out of the way. Dontrell Hilliard is definitely going to play a pass catching role in this backfield 
for at least the first eight weeks while Kareem Hunt is sidelined. But Chubb caught 20 passes on 27 targets in like his eight games that he started last year. If you double that out to 40 receptions, which I think will be even higher, or at least he's more likely to hit it now that Duke Johnson's out of the way, we saw him get involved in the passing game immediately with Baker Mayfield in their first preseason game, which was great to see, obviously. I think he's going to hit 40, 40 catches, if not 45. And if you're telling me that Nick Chubb, who gets carry totals of like 20 plus almost every time he's on the field, along with that breakaway run rate, plus 40 to 45 receptions, which is two a game on some games, I'm sure he'll have three or four. Nick Chubb has a fantastic floor with a very, very real ceiling. I think his ceiling is easily leading the NFL in rushing yards. And just, I, I, you need to stop thinking about Kareem Hunt. He is 10 weeks away from coming back to the field. You, you can't, you're not going to win fantasy leagues 10 weeks down the line on some hypothetical theory that he might have some role in this offense. They got him because it was a great depth play. $1 million for an all pro running back is just fantastic front office moves. Sure, there's some PR on the backside that you have to handle. But getting rid of Duke Johnson, this is just a depth play. A guy who can catch the ball, who might carve out a little bit of a role down the stretch. But by this point in the season, Chubb's going to have over 1,000 total yards from scrimmage and probably already won you a spot in your playoffs. So the Browns will obviously have a much better team than they did last year. The offense is going to be better. Better game scripts for Nick Chubb in the ground game. I'm all in on this talent opportunity. In the second round, I think he is a must draft player. That is my top 10 rankings. If you want the top 50 overall, you know what to do. It's that link down below that will get you access to to it. Thank you for joining me for today's video. I hope you found it actionable and informational. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button and make sure you drop those two comments down below. Actually, just one comment because you already know who the 110 is. What was the question again? Oh, who's the worst team in the NFL and why? Automatically entered into the draft bag giveaway. Hit that thumbs up button. I'm about to do a gift so George can make this into one. I love you. I'm out.